I'm no different than any other Japanese American person here in Los Angeles. Work as an artist, run errands, and I pay my bills, just like everyone else. But sometimes, when the day is done and the opportunity arises, I open my secret little restaurant. It's there I discover who I truly am, one dish at a time. I call that place the Shokudo. Hey there, it's John again in the Shokudo, thinking about the next dish that we're going to make. Uh, what's that next dish called? It's called Pakai, and there's a lot more to this dish than just its name, especially since we don't exactly know why we call it that. Okay, so where did we even get the dish from? Well, we have this recipe for Pakai largely due to the efforts of one person, John Nishio. Hmm. You're gonna get to learn how to make Pakai from him when he comes to the Shokudo later. Oh, nice! I'm super looking forward to it. Let's get into it. I don't feel like I'm in the right place. The, the, the register isn't here. I mean, that's the first thing I looked at when I came here to make sure that they had the, the botan candy that I wanted. And, and then our friend Shang standing there. You know, people, a lot of people said he was kind of a stern guy, but to us, he was family. Where the bar is now, used to be our favorite booths for some reason. They, they had partition booths here and they had black curtains and they would put me in these big old wooden high chairs with a wooden table. One of the very first solid foods that I got to eat was hamu and rice. So that was my baby food. <laughs> in this little patio here, there used to be cages of ducks, chickens, and uh, pigeons stuck maybe six cages high and I asked one of the waiters, oh you keep these as pets for eggs? And he says, no, we, we kill them and we cook them for you. Uh, oh! <laughs> the current owners did a great job of restoring the place and they had to adapt to current times. But it, at least it's here, you know, at least this restaurant is here, Little Tokyo is here. I try to do whatever I can to help them stay here, you know. It's our heritage. And we used to have all of our banquets and funeral gatherings and wedding banquets up there in the mezzanine. And I remember standing up there and looking down at all the people eating, seeing what they were eating compared to what we were eating. But that was our there, a big gathering place up there. Oh yeah, oh, oh, wow. This brings back memories. Wow, you know, this seems so small now, but 200 people fit in here. They had long tables along here and then over here. Right after World War II, my parents and her, um, on the Nishio side and on my mom's side, had nothing when they came back from the camps. So they would come to Fari's Cafe and uh, look Mar and the others would say, order whatever you want um, when, you, when you can pay, you know, pay us. So, <clears throat> meant a lot to the family. The owners, the Zhang family was really special. They took care of us. And, you know, right after World War II, I remember going to restaurants and being refused service. But here we felt safe. We could come, welcome like family. It was, a haven. Yeah, it's not just a restaurant. It's family. It's a special place.
everybody, my name is John Kenzo Okea, and welcome to the Shokudo. Today we are joined by Chef John Nishio. Thank you so much for coming out to the Shokudo. You're welcome. Today we are learning to make pakai, and we are going to get started. I'm excited. What do we do first? Well, this is going to be the Far East Cafe style yes. that used to be on First Street in LA. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it the 19th. 30s, 40s, 50s away. Yeah. Ooh, I'm so excited. Let's get into it. Competition. Yeah. The Damascus. Wow. So these these knives my wife is forbidden to touch. <laughs> oh, I see. And if she does use it because she gets lazy, I get mad. Oh. <laughs> and then she'll tell her friend, there are knives that John won't let me use. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm like, those are my knives. Those are my knives. Oh, I You don't touch my knives. <laughs> Well, this is a small one. Mm -hmm. You're gonna shave it down. Oh, from here. Uh -huh. Ooh, very Filipino style. I like it. Yeah. This is my first time handling a pineapple. I need you to have the uh, patience of the gods with me. Uh, I've had moments where, exactly like you, I'm explaining to my wife. I'm like, no, it has to be like this. Otherwise, it sticks to the bottom. And she's like, just drop it in. It's okay. And I'm like, no, no. There's a, there's a, there's a way we have to do it so it doesn't do this. And she's like, just let's get something out. <laughs> Uh, we tenderize the meat with a marinade of egg whites, shoyu, ginger. Did, oh, did I tell you to put in the sake or no? I didn't. Just put it. Oh, no, I knew I left something out. Oh, it's okay. You don't want to cook it too dark or get dry. Yeah. Pakai was is the favorite Chinese American dish of my father. We always had to get this for him. I wouldn't always get the, my favorite, but. Every time we went to dinner, we had this Ah, I see. Talk to my dad and my aunties, and they're like, that's where grandpa went. And they're mm -hmm. so excited. Okay, yeah, it's okay. Cool. Uh, we're gonna make your pot kai sauce. Excellent. Try it up. Actual owners of the Far East Cafe told me how they made theirs, and there's only four ingredients, mm -hmm. which surprised me. Water, sugar, white vinegar, and uh, ketchup. Oh, no food coloring. The red that everybody remembers came from the ketchup. That's awesome. So the more red you want your sauce, the more ketchup you add. Yeah, I've never had this combo, so I'm very interested. Yeah. But this is just real simple restaurant syrup. I've never had that flavor. Wow, that's cool. Okay. That's the Far East flavor. Wow, that's great. Yeah, pretty good. Oh my gosh, this is a new flavor combo. Never had this flavor combo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why when we go to other restaurants, we go, nah, that's not right because this is so simple that other restaurants probably don't do it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then we need to make a slurry of cornstarch and water. To we'll do a partial thickening. Hmm. See how that comes out. But this has to be pretty thick. Oh, that's good. Just oh yeah, that's already getting thick. There we go. So turn off the heat. We're done. Now that we've got all of our veggies and our meat and our sauce prepared, mm -hmm. we're going to start with the onions. We'll just start turning translucent to stir them up. Okay. Get them coated with the oil. And then next goes in the pineapple because you want to get it good and hot and it's thick. Wow, straight away, huh? Yeah, this is a fast dish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is. Well, I can already smell that, yep. And we'll just stir that in, get it coated. So, judging from the color of the onions, let's stir that in. Just toss this in. The pineapple should be hot, and meat's probably hot enough, then. Mm. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I'm smelling the sweet. Oh, sweet, fragrant. It smells <laughs> like Far East Cafe. It does, yeah. After the Far East feast, this is very recognizable now. I bet my dad would come over here and eat it right now. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're done. 
Nice, thank you so much for showing me this. This is great. Yeah. This is Japanese American history you're putting into the bowl. Oh my gosh, I am so honored, seriously. Yeah. Our Issei ancestors ate this, our Nisei parents ate this. Oh my gosh. Or your grandparents, I guess. I, I really wish I was around to have this be part of my culture, you know? Like mm. eating this part of what I, I have, you know? Mm -hmm. It's so great that we can make it. Oh, that's beautiful. There you go. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for teaching Suboy. me. Arigato. Arigato. All right. Let's see. Take a little bit of everything. How are you doing? Yes, please. Go on. Yes, please. Grab your goodies. Oh, I'm excited. Okay. Mm. It's good. Hmm, I can picture Ji-chan, Ba-chan, and my dad sitting next to me at the party's cafe. Mmm. Mmm. This is so Japanese American. Mm -hmm. This is so reminiscent of early, early, early childhood. Mm -hmm. With my grandma and everything. Oh my gosh. Mm. Oh my gosh. Oh. That's good. All my family members know about this dish, and I've mm -hmm. just learned about this dish. Uh, my question to you is, um, what makes this dish so important? Far East Cafe did not discriminate against us. We would go to American restaurants. They wouldn't serve us. They'd give us dirty looks. Oh, there was shoot. racism. Wow. So we would always feel unwelcome. But at Far East Cafe, they welcomed us like family. Oh, wow. Okay. It, it, that's what the connection is. It's the food, yeah, but it, it's also, we think of the way we were treated. Yeah. We tre it's, it's something special. Yeah. Well, my, my dad, <clears throat> you know, they came back in 1945 and uh, their house was ransacked, the furniture, everything was gone. It was just a shell of a house. They oh, even geez. stole the sinks. <laughs> so God. they had nothing, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, they went to Far East Cafe, and you know he'd had a few pennies in his pocket. And he said, yeah, uh, "What can I get for this?" Yeah. And they told him, "Order whatever you want. Mm. You know, you can pay us back when you can." It's incredible. And, and so it it got him. You know, and yeah. they offered free credit to a lot of families because wow. they couldn't afford it. And they said, "Just pay us when you can." Oh my gosh, that's incredible. You know. I mean, since we can't get it anymore at Far East Cafe, mm -hmm. if I can make something similar or, or like those dishes, like I, I do nine of their dishes, it brings back all of that feeling, that emotion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my grandfather would cry about it, talking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was an emotional bond, too. Yeah, I totally have a way better understanding. You're, it's not just the food. Yeah. It, it was... The, it really places you at the time and a time where you guys are being discriminated yeah. and then coming to this place and having a restaurant just openly accept you and you guys are enjoying this together. That's, that's lovely. Coming up, we are going to make pakai for one of my earliest childhood friends, Rachel Lowe. Rachel and I met back in elementary school, and we've taken many of the same Asian American studies classes together in college. We could talk at length about what it means to be Asian American, but only recently did I learn that Rachel cooks, like, a lot. She even has her own TikTok channel with over 115,000 followers. So, I've asked Rachel to come by the Shokudo to see what she thinks about Pakai and the story that we've learned from John Nishio. I'm really scared I'm like talking this up. I'm like, oh yeah, he did this and this and this and I'm ha ha ha. And then I eat it and I'm like, oh God. What this I is do? a different dish. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Chef to chef, please be honest. I'm, I'm excited. Mm. 
That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's weird because it smells really like vinegary, like tangy. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about how much vinegar is it. It doesn't taste that like, you know, pungent. Yeah. It's really good. So when you um, were learning how to cook this from John Ishio, were, were you super afraid uh, when he was taste testing it at the end? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much anxious when any cook comes to me and, you know, talk about recipes or this and that. But um, with John Nishio especially, I felt like I had the weight of a culture on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, like the fact that Johnny Shia spent so much of his life kind of searching for this exact recipe is like a little bit incidental, right? I think if I were to kind of psychoanalyze what was happening there, it's more of him digging into the feeling and the past and the history of the dish more than the dish itself. Oh yeah, yeah. I could see that, yeah. I mean, he would often say that you know, he he eat he like he said he like went up and down the coast, going to different Chinese restaurants, different Cantonese restaurants, mm -hmm. trying to trying to replicate the 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 taste, the textures, the pakai as he remembered it was. But yeah, in a lot of ways, probably what he was looking for was that sense of home that he had gotten by going to the Far East Cafe, but that he could no, no longer get because it closed down. I think what's kind of wild to wrap my head around is this idea that as, you know, John Ishio has passed on this recipe to you mm -hmm. every day to some degree, even though I'm not always considering it, like I am able to do that with the content that I make and the food that I cook and mm -hmm. put out on the internet. And when I get comments of acknowledgement that people completely forgot about a recipe that they grew up with and or a recipe they remember but they just haven't cooked in a long time or didn't know how to cook or their mom used to cook it for them and like their mom passed away and they you know haven't been able to eat it since then that is a a really I think impactful part of you know being able to share food. It reminds me this the <laughs> everyone has their own ratatouille moment, you know, where Anton Ego is like eating the ratatouille and then just gonna he gets transported. Do you not know what I'm talking about? Oh my god. Seems Pixar. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets transported back to when he was a little kid in France or whatever and he's uh his bike his broken bikes outside but his mom makes ratatouille in the same way that Remy did the rat. Okay. When my niece my niece that was just born is named Remy like the rat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's what a, you took away from And that is as much as we will take away. <laughs> when, when Rachel was talking, actually, I had that in my head. Yeah, that, exactly. That scene. Right. When I taste it, I can, I can see my mom sitting at the table with us, with my grandparents next to us. Yeah, it's kind of moving. Yeah, it's, food's like a time machine. You don't think about a lot of things, but when you have that aroma and that flavor, bam, you're there. The beautiful thing about food is, is that I talk to my aunties, and usually we talk about surface things, so how's school, how's life, right? But it's not until we, I did the Far East Feast thing, and I met you there, and they're like, oh, you're having a almond duck? Oh, when I was a kid, and all of these like memories, exactly. and now I'm connecting with my aunties in like this completely different way. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, almond duck, what else did you have? And they're like, oh, what about that ground pork? Are you gonna have that ground pork dish? I'm like, yes, he's, he made that, and it's amazing, and they're like, what? So, <laughs> yeah. through food, it's like you can open up so much. When we started having the Far East Feast, I was blown away. I mean, I realized that hundreds of people felt like I did about this place. And uh, it was moving to see people eat the food and talk about their childhood and their long lost relatives. Some were brought to tears. They choked up talking about it, just like I do. And I realized how important food is you know, to your memories and your link with ancestors who are gone now. It's, it's a really special thing. I 
don't know, I feel similar ways when, you know, with Grateful Crane, we were performing all the music that our grandparents and, and ancestors, they enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And there's a similar pressure to, like, recreate the song in the way that they heard it and that they enjoyed it. And, mm -hmm. and in a similar vein, it's like, that's our culture that we have to preserve. Yeah. In a similar way. <laughs> yeah, I totally understand that. Yeah, but then the idea of like preservation of culture is so interesting because I wonder if we would feel the same pressure if we, you know, were born in our respective like motherlands, <laughs> yeah. you know, and and it's like it's a maybe an un unfair pressure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in a lot of ways, we're like the last ones, mm -hmm. you know, because if we let it drop, since we we're not in that environment anymore, right. and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. Right. But then there's also these things that are so like this dish which are so Asian American, you know, even brought more broadly, like it's this intersection of Chinese American and Japanese American. And that's like a culture all of its own. I kind of told you the other day that I, like in some ways I, I'm obviously Chinese American, but then in other ways, I consider myself more like Asian American because mm -hmm. there's like a lot of universal experiences, mm -hmm. no matter what you are, because you're seen as one group, like, like it or not, right? So you're yeah. treated, Kind of similarly yeah mm -hmm. but in a lot of ways i feel like that adds an additional level of burden <laughs> because mm, japanese sure. americans our little community is is so distinct mm -hmm. yeah there is that additional pressure to preserve something that was created here in america in our own community mm -hmm. that sure. if something new were to come from japan it wouldn't be japanese american right yeah so like this is this is my family in this dish in the mm. songs that we sing mm -hmm. <laughs> the fact that i grew up around so many ja people and grew up in such a way where i ended up almost identifying with that culture even though it's not maybe my culture mm -hmm. is very telling of how welcoming those communities were right and those those families opened their doors to me and I was always eating dinner at their house. And that's why I grew up like, you know, eating nori and rice and being like, wow, this is like <laughs> great food. And this isn't like something that I love. Um, I wouldn't have had that if these families weren't so welcoming. Uh -huh. Just that communal mentality that I think is shared, mm. w whether you're Chinese or Korean or Japanese or Filipino or mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. The shokudo here, what we're trying to do is find the good in maybe events that were in our history that have been historically seen as bad, like the whole camp experience. Maybe that helped us figure out as a community that we needed to do things together to get by for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's why we're here now. Maybe that's why the JAs had that mentality and then, you know, we're able to extend that to you. It'll welcome you into their home. Just like the, you know, the mm -hmm. restaurant owners welcomed the J community into their restaurant. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of paying it back in a way. Whoa. Yeah, it just <laughs> goes both ways, I think. Full circle, geez. <laughs> full, full circle. <laughs> now, you know, Michael comes to my house. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told him I, I was doing my Far East feast to honor them and this restaurant for everything they did for their community. And uh, told them, you know, what their restaurant meant to the Japanese American community and to our family. And we all had a good cry together, actually. <laughs> yeah. It was a special restaurant, special family, and it's at a really difficult time. I mean, they were there for us when white America turned against us, when we couldn't eat at other restaurants, we knew we could come here. So we did, almost every single week. recipes from my past and my history and my family's history and if I am being really honest it's it's really about me 
learning these things and almost forcing myself to learn these things. And I think that's why I do it on a public stage as well, of getting deeper into my family's history, my cultural history, and mm -hmm. all of these things that for many decades of my life, I was able to just kind of ignore or shelve or pretend like they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. This is kind of my way of taking that off the shelf, opening it up and really exploring like what that, what that looks like. You know, what we're doing here in the Shokudo, I, I can meet these kind of people, learn their recipes, and then through the process kind of piece together and understand, oh, this is part of my history. Oh, this is part of my family's history too. Now I'm starting to understand, you know. I think for me, like the interesting thing, because I don't speak the language and my grandparents don't speak English, is like as these other parts of your culture, like you know, this is kind of sad, but inevitably get stripped away mm -hmm. where you don't speak the language. That's something that's harder to hold on to. Mm -hmm. Food is something that has more, I think, like sticking sticking power or something. Oh, um, yeah. It just stays around for much longer. And like, I can really bond with food and understand the story of food, even though I don't speak the language, mm, right? Absolutely. And I think that's actually like probably the strongest tie that I have to my culture, which maybe not to make this into a therapy session. Maybe that's why I like food so much. You mm -hmm. know, I've never really like thought about it in that context. But mm -hmm. it means so much to me to be able to like learn this and cook this because with this, it just comes all that weight and all that baggage of what you guys had to go through during your time. You know, that's that's something I never thought I'd discover just by making a dish and by going through it with you. I never realized that there's so much history behind it. I'm learning something that is, has affected my family too. Mm -hmm. well, That's crazy. The, the, the Niseis and Issa didn't talk about being thrown in concentration camps. Yeah, right. It, they were humiliated and it, too painful to bring up. Yeah. Little Tokyo and this restaurant were the like a light in the really dark dark part of our history. Yeah, yeah. I remember my dad, you know, look Mar, mm -hmm. you know, he used to be by the register and then he got older and older and pretty soon he was sitting on a little chair right inside the entrance and he was greeting people, but he, we could tell his health was failing over the decades. No oh, shit. So my dad, un totally uncharacteristically, went up to him and uh, just thanked him. Mm. You know, for everything that they had done since the 30s. Wow. And uh, especially after they got back from the war. And him, Dad had tears in his eyes, and so did Mr. Marr. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> but he wanted to get it off his chest yeah. before it's too late. Mm. And uh, that was burned into my mind. But I never talk about it because oh, it, it makes me cry thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but... Uh, there was, there was a bond in yeah. his family. You're making delicious food and you're remembering the past and you're carrying that on. You know, like I feel like I kind of need to do that too. You know, be in the Shokudo and meet more people, tell more stories and cook more and have these stories be a part of the food that we make. Well, that's, that's just so like the TV show. Yeah. All right. Each dish is tied to another story. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's what I want to do. I just want to keep meeting people like you, and I want to hear about my past. And I want to share to be I want to go up to other people and be like, you know, Pakai is. And they're like, what the heck are you talking about? I'm Chinese. I don't know what that word is. And I'm like, well, you should try this because there's some roots in here. Like, I, I can't wait to share that part of my culture now. It's really cool, you know? The more people who know about it, the better. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, it was an integral part of generations of Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. and I'm afraid we're losing it, you know? So mm -hmm. any way I can preserve some of the memories, the better. Yeah, well, let's keep going. Let's keep passing this on. This is great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for coming, yeah, man. You're great. Yeah, yeah thank you. Good time. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Plus, I like to eat it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I was like, this is great. <laughs> I'm okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs>Right, so a big thank you to John Nishio for showing me how to make pakai. And to Rachel Lowe for sharing her thoughts on the power that particular recipes can have on us as individuals, as families, as a community. Oh, and before you leave, 
Uh, if you have a TikTok, please give Rachel a follow at Rachel underscore loaf. Like, as in a loaf of bread. Uh, she's got some amazing videos on there that you guys will super enjoy. Um, Alright, so anyways, thank you so much again for joining us, and we'll see you again soon here in the Shokudo. Jane!